See that he cried tears as of a mother weeping over her dying child. That sobs tore from his throat as those of a breadwinning father who has lost his job. That he grieved with all the vitriol of an aged widow for whom 50 years of marriage was not enough and mourned with all the heartache of a jilted young lover. If you would kneel there, you will see the violence of his suffering. But if you would lift your eyes, you will see that same Jesus overcoming the world. a story full from the familiarity of pain, but disturbing in that it is Jesus who so vividly feels it. There is comfort for you and I today, because Jesus, once overcome, has become the overcomer. And so can you. Ludwig von Beethoven was born in 1770. He had a drunk and a fanatic for a father. But he somehow became a great musician, an innovative composer. Yet in 1802, this man whose life appeared to by now be going so harmoniously took note of a very dissonant theme. He was going deaf. Beethoven despaired of life. Maybe it makes sense. A man who makes a living based on what he could hear and cause others to hear but he could not end it. Instead, he overcame, and in 1823, 21 years after this deafness began to set in, he completed his ninth symphony. And that symphony's fourth and final movement ends with a choir singing in German, Be embraced, you millions. This kiss for the whole world. Beyond the star canopy must a loving father dwell. That would be an ode somewhat difficult to appropriate after a life like Beethoven's, became known as Ode to Joy. Yet, despite a rough beginning and a disappointing middle, there was, like the Ninth Symphony, a rousing finale, because sorrow can be a <coughs> And still, I wonder, where in all this mess, where is God? Mark tells us that from the cross, Jesus cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God seems to have left the narrative well before then. Where is God as Jesus is on the cross? Where is God as Jesus is spat upon and whipped? Where is God? as Jesus is falsely accused. And where is God? Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus begs and pleads with no response. And I wonder if God isn't just exactly where I ask us to place ourselves earlier, kneeling beside Christ. We know, tragically, that there are some Catastrophes God does not prevent. But as Kendall Renfro, one of my fellow seminarians at Truett, reminded us in one of our chapels, there is no tragedy. God does not mourn. And I wonder if the tears of this very human Jesus here in the garden could be mixed with those of a very divine Father who is mourning what is to come. And I wonder if you and I could see clearly in the midst of our own anguish. If we would see God kneeling beside us, crying our tears. And I wonder if those moments of divine silence could be turned into moments of pastoral presence if only we would cease demanding prophetic protest. Certainly there's a time for presence and a time for protest. But should we let God impart what He desires to impart? Let God's will be done. We would be far more richly blessed than if we persist in making our own demands. For Christ somehow 
receive the strength to stand and go forward and to call his disciples to do the same. It was that silent comfort of the divine which enabled him and which will enable you. So for those of us who are disciples, let us arise. Let us go. The hour has come. In just a few hours we depart from here to homes or hotels and from there back to the trials and the tribulations of life. But before you go, kneel first beside Christ. Kneel first in the comforting presence of the divine and take heart for he has overcome the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.